Uh, right now, let's uh, talk to my next guest. He's a former Deputy Prime Minister, Conservative MP Damien Green, one of the many 80 Tory backbench rebels who were threatening uh, to uh, vote for an amendment uh, tabled by Sir Graham Brady, uh, basically demanding that Parliament has a say over emergency measures. In the end, uh, an offer of, uh, well, some sort of middle ground was offered by Matt Hancock, the Health Secretary, which is an offer that uh, there will be a promise of a vote on any significant measures on any national lockdown rules. Uh, Damien Green, um, why did the rebels uh, feel that that was a fair compromise and not demand to have more say? Because it's it's more or less what we were asking for. If you, uh, Graham Brady's original motion said that it, it should be uh, national measures, not local measures, and you have to allow some kind of get-out clause, if you like, because it, it is perfectly conceivable. You know, a government would have to take emergency action within a few days when Parliament's on recess or things like that. So you do have to have, uh, as I say, those, those get-out clauses in it. But basically, the government has now committed that it will, if it brings forward national proposals, uh, then it will do them with a, with a date to start in, you know, in sometime in the future. So Parliament will be able to have a vote on the issue first, which is how laws ought to be made in this country. Well, Sid, I think a lot of us understood why there had to be emergency measures brought in at short notice uh, back in the spring. Lots of concern, obviously, uh, about the exponential growth in the virus. We are not seeing exponential growth now. There isn't really any justification at the current time, certainly, for any measures to be brought in without any notice. And we saw, didn't we, uh, at the beginning of this week, uh, the Health Secretary announced a number of new measures and then new measures came into force. And we only found out about them almost the next morning, that there were a whole load of new rules about landlords paying, playing music in pubs of, of a certain decibel level and the like that, that no one had even been told about. Um, it is a very, very strange state of affairs living in a free uh, and honest democracy to have laws brought into place which we know nothing about until just by chance. I mean, is that any way to run a country? Well, uh, that's that's what we've we've stopped happening. That's that is precisely oh, the, the point. The government could argue that you know what decibel level landlords play their music at is a, is not a significant measure. They wouldn't have to consult you on that. I, th I think they would. I mean, the example given because because. We ask those questions about you know, what, what what are you calling significant, and you know, to some extent you have to uh, devise it on the basis of what's presented. And and one of the points they made was that what wouldn't be significant would be the you know, the removal of a couple of countries from the air bridge system where you don't need to quarantine. Now it's fair enough you're not you're not going to you know, hold Parliament back to say. You know, one small island somewhere is now you know, no longer yeah. able. You, know, you can come back and not quarantine. So it's, yeah, it's fair enough that there are some things like that. But anything that was going to affect every pub in the country or every restaurant in the country uh, or businesses um, would be significant. And so Parliament would get a vote on that. And and absolutely, I agree that the thought of having uh, rules by decree, as it were. Uh, is is completely wrong in our system, and and you know that's that's why there was such a head of steam uh, behind Graham Brady's amendment. And what did you make of Sir Lindsay Hoyle, the Commons Speaker, saying that he would not actually allow the amendment to even be uh, uh, you know put forward and voted on? And he he was sort of citing you know various Commons precedents and about the need for for swift action. But did you feel that was the right decision? Well, I, I did. I mean, the, the point he made, which was a good one, is that uh, because of the particular type of motion we were discussing, that any amendment to it um, would be legally dubious. And, and we might end up with the situation of the courts deciding uh, whether what Parliament had passed was legal or not. And we all want to avoid that for obvious reasons. You know, Parliament should make the laws, yeah. the courts should interpret yes. them. You don't I want don't, the courts saying you can't do that. I don't think we can go back through 2019 all over again. Not, not Please, this thing. No. Uh, what do you make <laughs> no. of the front pages today? Stanley Johnson, the Prime Minister's father, uh, spotted and photographed in a shop uh, without a mask. And we don't know whether he's got any sort of exemption uh, for wearing a mask or not. But Jeremy Corbyn uh, spotted at a, a dinner party, a photograph of a dinner party, um, I'm assuming in Islington, I'm taking a punt. Uh, there were nine people, assuming one person is taking the photograph. Now, I mean, you haven't got an exemption. That's the rule of six being broken. Um, do you think it matters if people like Stanley Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn break the rules? Well, it does because people think that uh, if, if somebody's breaking the rules, then, then why can't I break the rules? And if everyone starts breaking the rules, uh, then the, the pandemic will get bigger. So... 
uh, individuals, I mean, these days there are camera phones everywhere. So if you're a known public figure, then wherever you are, somebody will be taking a, a, a picture of you. Uh, I am particularly scrupulous on you know, wearing a mask on the tube and things like that because I've you know, seen one of my colleagues photographed on a train not wearing it. I'm sure completely innocently, I'm sure he just forgot. But um, but yes, it's it's a sort of one of the responsibilities of public figures these days is, 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 is to wear your mask where you need to. Um, can I just ask you also finally about a different story? But the channel migrants been very much in the news over the entire summer. Um, now we hear that the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, is talking uh, about... Uh, um, not allowing asylum seekers if they've come from the EU, come on boats from the, the France to claim asylum. Uh, there was a, a, a plan looked at uh, shipping everyone off to Extension Island. Yes, we all had to look up where it was uh, in the South Atlantic. Uh, now, if we talk about putting them on old ferries while they're processed, you're a former immigration minister yourself in the Home Office. Um, what do you make of any of those plans? Well, I mean, the, the trick with all of these plans is, is are they practical and, and are they legal? Um, I, I mean, obviously, none of us knows the, the details of these supposed uh, ferry plans or not. Um, it, it seems to me it slightly depends where the ferries are, because if they're inside British territorial waters, I would suspect uh, people are effectively already in this country and therefore they have the right to claim asylum. So it's, I'm afraid it's slightly boring technical details like that that will decide whether this is practical or not. Uh, I'm tempted to say that given the uh, recent history with the government and ferries, um, I'm not sure I'd be reaching for ferries as the first solution to any problem. <laughs> no, this is this is hiring ferry companies that don't actually own any ferries in All the event of, that, of a no-deal yes. Brexit. Yeah. Oh, ha simpler, happier times, Damien. What, 2019? Yes, yes quite. <laughs> However bad things are now, they, they can always get worse. <laughs> Damien Green, former Deputy Prime Minister, Conservative MP, thank you very much indeed. Let me just bring in Dave Chawner. Oh, we do get some laughs out of these some terrible times, do we not, Dave? Um, what, what do you make of this uh, this migrant boat plan? We, we just seem to have a different idea out of the Home Office every single minute on how to deal with the migrants. And, and uh, I'm sad, I do think an awful lot of the, uh, us general public do despair. Oh, absolutely. It's like a card game. You put in one form of accommodation, one form of troubles, put them in a hat, spin them around and see what you get out. I mean, if migrants get to live on cruise liners, I'd love that. And I wouldn't have to pay, you know, a couple of grand for the privilege a month. It sounds brilliant. Yeah. Wh why not? I mean, again, they're all empty at the moment anyway, aren't they? Uh, no one's <laughs> going on the cruises. Don't you? Thank you very much.